the right way out. <laughs> Could you come on the tube, please? Mm -hmm. Nobody's masked at all. No, it's no but one of us coming with us. Nothing's happening now. Push, one, two, three. Okay. Four. Right. Well, do you want to go ahead? Can I? Yeah. Oh, thank you. And then when I've finished, shall I? Uh, I'll go off the platform and leave it all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, does one speak into either of these or both? Do you know? You just stand between them and they pick up. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, so, um, I'm here, here to welcome you to this uh, rather magnificent setting and to our happy event and to lead into tonight's proceedings, which will be conducted by the IAS Chair, Sarah Pierce. The coming together of this year's Richard Barnett IAS Lecture and our Diamond Jubilee celebration is, a happy, and, and is happy and wonderful appro wonderfully appropriate. We have a rather full program, but we won't keep you sitting for too long, and the reception afterwards will perhaps offer light affair. Three people are named as instrumental in the founding of the society. Richard Barnett, Alec Lerner, and Leon Shalit. And in addition, Yigal Yadin's significant role is acknowledged. But of all these, Richard Barnett was in many ways the true founder. Through his vision, through his clear-sighted perseverance, through his instinct for the ways of British academic and public life, and simply through the amount that he did for the society. He was the presiding genius of its evolution. It was surely Richard Barnett who made the IAS a contender. His understanding made of IAS a proper London learned society, following a traditional pattern with the highest academic standards, yet reaching out in a very tangible and in fact modern way to its audiences. IAS was set up in London's heady Masada moment, of, uh, as I've called it, uh, some of you may even have read the Strata editorial of uh, 2021 um, that, uh, where I uh, spoke about this at greater length. Yigal Yadin brought his planned Masada expedition to the attention of Londoners. A little digging, so to speak, re reveals a very close association between the two events, our founding and Masada. Uh, the um, putting together of the great uh, Masada project. That moment represents the convergence of several things. Israeli archaeology had a huge buzz about it, not only in Israel, but abroad, not only for Jews, but for a wider world. The ideological role of biblical and second temple archaeology in the building of the new state may be analyzed and discussed, but undoubtedly, the furious rate of discovery and interpretation was stirring and extraordinary. There had been nothing like it since the remarkable days of the Palestine Exploration Fund's early expeditions, and the PF was founded in 1865 with Queen Victoria among the original subscribers. But the state of Israel was very young and resources scarce, Yadin's vision, as well as his magnetic personality, his good connections in London, and the strong support he received from keen Zionists, Jewish and non-Jewish, including David Astor of the Observer newspaper, who did so much to spread the word, led to success beyond expectation. Yadin's organization and... Um, uh, and uh, his appeal generated, uh, and the uh, Astor's appeal generated the volunteers, of whom I, in fact, was one, recruited precisely through seeing something in the Observer. We were an oddly assorted and vastly varied, but totally dedicated bunch, slightly crazed, in fact. At least one veteran ex-volunteer from Masada, a London woman artist, is represented in the early committee lists of IAS. So, like all good organizations, the IAS was a response to active interest and enthusiasm that were not adequately catered for elsewhere. We see also in its founding a crystallization of the insight 
that people needed to be informed and involved to become committers supporters. That's true of anything. And another insight that building enthusiasm is as important as collecting funds in getting a great project off the ground. The IS was particularly well equipped for the first role. Richard Barnett, whose academic and field experience was surely crucial almost from the beginning, very soon became vice chair and then chair of the new society, and you'll hear more about him from Sarah. Tonight we also celebrate Barbara Barnett, now our special vice president extraordinary, who has been, dare I say it, through all these years, the inspiring, brilliantly practical, and fearless mainstay of the IS. And very long may that continue. I hope I may be allowed to say just a little bit about that. The notes in her personal archive, which she has handed to me in plastic shopping bags, are fantastic revealing so much of the society, uh, though with sad gaps, we're still trying to put together uh, a full archive, ranging from a 40th anniversary mem memorandum called Some Suggestions for Discussion for a Way Ahead, and demanding especially, I quote, fresh efforts to increase our popular appeal. Uh, she was well ahead of her time. Also, extensive delving into the society's investments, believe it or not. There's a friendly letter from Teddy Colick thanking Barbara for inviting him to preside over the society, which he seems not to have done. Extensive correspondence with Richard Barnett lecturers over the years, and several exercise books containing detailed, tightly packed notes from lectures. Yes, she was never not listening. And at the back there, um, uh, there are some copies of the piece she wrote for Strata called, I think, 40 Years On or some such. Uh, they're, they're, these are the off prints um, which still remained. And anybody interested, it's a lovely article, um, is welcome to take one home. Um, we do, I know, have Barbara's participation in spirit and we're delighted to welcome members of her family. The event is being filmed by our ingenious and devoted treasurer uh, and ex-co-chair, if I may call him that, Anthony Rabin, which we hope will be some compensation to Barbara for not being here. We have the participation tonight of three ex-chairs. One is Hugh Williamson, whose wisdom guided the society for many years and who is our official host here at the Academy. Another. Martin Goodman, also a fellow, this evening's distinguished speaker, also has a long and close involvement with the society. In addition, we have the involvement of two strata editors, um, though I don't see David Jacobson here at the moment, um, and um, in, uh, at long distance through his video of Shimon Gibson, um, who um, worked very closely with Barbara, I discover, and Richard in the early years. Among other former executive members who've helped the society over the years, it's good to welcome John Curtis, Richard Barnett's rit literary executor, and Sam Moorhead of the British Museum. As real life return returns to London, it's excellent that we restart our live events series on this high note. We've acquired new members and supporters over the two years of Zoom, and we've become international. We hope our US and Israel members will enjoy the film that Anthony is making with our excellent FIT um, uh, uh, people um, in due course. London's now brimful of activities, as we all know, and we've had notes of regret. The coincidence with the eve of Yom Ma'ut, Israel's Independence Day, has also produced a clash of commitments for some. But for those to whom this is meaningful, I hope it will be a pleasant way of marking the evening, and I wish them a happy holiday. Last but not least, tonight marks the launch of our appeal with a new direction, or is it a return to early beginnings? again, see Barbara's archive, in forging an association with specific archaeological excavations and supporting them to the best of our ability through our grants program for students, through expertise, and through a measure of direct assistance. We are hoping this will come to fruition rather soon. The video which you'll be seeing, which has come from Shimon 
Gibson in the States will show his exciting new project for a Galilean synagogue site, while the short talk from Rebecca Welton, lecturer at Exeter University, a veteran of the Mount Zion excavations, and I can safely say our youngest trustee, will, um, will speak about a dig to which we've sent students in the past and with which various of our officers have been personally involved. It only remains for me now to hand over to Sarah Pierce for her own words about the society. She will then introduce the Richard Barnett Memorial Lecture and our speaker. We'll proceed to Shimon Gibson's video and hear from Rebecca. Anthony Rabin will wind up and then, I think, with a vote of thanks, and then we will move to food and drink in the gallery. Do feel free before that to help yourselves to the water which is in the other hall. You may feel you need it. I think the air conditioning's been put on now, and please enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Tessa. So, my role is to introduce the lecture itself and to say some words about Richard Barnett. On March the 13th, 1987, a notice appeared in the Jewish Chronicle entitled Doctor Honoured. This announced that an annual lectureship is to be endowed by the Spanish and Portuguese Jews Congregation of London, together with the Jewish Historical Society of England, the Friends of the Jewish Museum, and the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society, as a memorial to Dr. Richard David Barnett, formerly Keeper of the Department of Western Asiatic Antiquities at the British Museum, who had died in the previous year. A fund was set up to raise £5,000 for the lecture. And the first IAS Richard Barnett Memorial Lecture was delivered later in 1987 by John Curtis and V.D. Lippmann. It's my privilege today to introduce the 2022 Richard Barnett Memorial Lecture as we honor Dr. Barnett as founder and prolific builder of the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society. In reaching this jubilee landmark of 60 years of the society, it is especially fitting to remember the man who brought the society to life and kept it in robust life through his extraordinary efforts, including his work from 1969 to his death in 1986 as chair of the society. It is a particular privilege to welcome on behalf of our society, friends and members of Dr. Barnett's family, his three children who are here with us this evening, and in spirit, Barbara, Dr. Barnett's wife, who sends greetings to you all and joins us, as Tessa said, from her home with a small time lapse via the filmed version of these events. Born in Acton in 1909, Richard Barnett made many important contributions to world scholarship and to the Anglo-Jewish community and its history. As an archeologist, a Sephardi historian, an honorary archivist of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in London. The son of Dr. Lionel Barnett, an eminent Sanskrit specialist of the era, Richard Barnett studied at Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, specializing in archeology. span From 1930 to 1932, he was a student at the British School of Archeology span in Athens. In 1932, he joined the staff of the British Museum, where he would work for 42 years, interrupted by the Second World War, in which he served in a number of institutions in the Admiralty, the Foreign Office, and from 1942 to 1946 as RAF intelligence officer in Egypt, Syria, Libya, and Turkey. He was a much, uh, a very busy and clearly very useful person, even in those early days. Appointed initially as assistant keeper of the Department um, of Egyptian and Assyrian Antiquities, in 1955 he was made the first keeper of the Department of Western Asiatic Antiquities at the British Museum, a post he held till retirement in 1974. Richard Barnett is the author of numerous scholarly works on Egypt, Assyria, Palestine, and other Middle East areas. 
His many major publications include the catalogue of Nimrod ivories in the British Museum, regarded as a landmark work in the field, second edition of which was published in 1975. Devoted to the history of the Anglo-Jewish community, Dr. Barnett's prolific contribut contributions include his role for many years uh, as the archivist, as I mentioned, of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in London. And his publications in this area include an edited volume on treasures of a London temple, which turns out to be the Beavis Marks Synagogue. And from 1959 to 1961, his service as president of the Jewish Historical Society of England. And we are delighted that Professor Mary Rubin, president of the Jewish Historical Society of England, is with us this evening, as our two societies, so long and strongly united by the life and work of Richard Barnett, meet to honor his memory and his achievements. For his many services to scholarship at home and abroad, Richard Barnett was elected Fellow of the British Academy in 1962 and made a Commander of the British Empire in 1974. And from 1974 to 75, he was visiting professor at the Hebrew University. And in 1979, at a ceremony in Jerusalem, he shared the Israel Museum's Persia Shimmel Prize, created in that year for services to archaeology in Israel and Bible lands. Back to 1961, the year of the founding of the society. Any account of these events must be indebted to Barbara Barnett's article, which we encourage you to take a copy of, published in 2000, celebrating 40 years of the society. There she makes clear that the idea of providing some encouragement from Britain for archaeological activities in Israel began to develop in 1958. There was growing interest at that time in biblical archaeology, she says, and in the exciting discoveries being made in the Holy Land. This led to the founding of the society in 1961. The founders of the society were Dr. Alec Lerner, Leon Charlotte, and Dr. Richard Barnett. Dr. Alec Lerner, the first chair of the society, a chief executive of Marks and Spencer, was active in many Anglo-Jewish organizations and emigrated to Israel in 1969, where, among other things, he was a government advisor and a governor of the Hebrew University. Like Alec Lerner, Leon Charlotte worked for Marks and Spencer. In an obituary of Charlotte, who died in 1996, Barbara Barnett records the description by Sir Richard Greenbury, chair of Marks and Spencer's at the time, of Charlotte, his former boss, as a man of enormous ability as well as wisdom. Charlotte had met Yigael Yardin <clears throat> during the Second World War, and they became lasting friends. While Yardin was on sabbatical in London, uh, Charlotte became involved in the planning and funding of Yardin's archaeological expeditions. And according to Barbara, this produced in Leon an enthusiasm for archaeology, which he retained for the rest of his life. Leon Charlotte emigrated to Israel in 1963 and was closely involved in support of the Masada excavations, assisting with the large-scale recruitment of volunteers who may have included Tessa for the dig. He will have managed Tessa at some point. For the Masada exhibition set up by the Observer newspaper in London, it was Charlotte who arranged storage facilities, which must have been quite some challenge with Marks and Spencers. Permanently settled in Israel, Charlotte remained a vice chair of the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society until his death. Founder members of the society included Yadin, um, go back to him, in 1961, then Associate Professor of Archaeology at Hebrew University, he arrived in London for a sabbatical year to prepare publications on the excavations at Hazor and his more recent discoveries of the Bar Kokhba letters and documents. A close friend of Lerner, Charlotte, and Richard Barnett, Yadin, gave the inaugural lecture of the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society in November 1961. probably can't read this, but I'll read it to you. Um, a letter of 1962 to the Jewish Chronicle, to which Richard Barnett wrote very frequently, 
uh, from himself and Leon Charlotte gives a good sense of the early ambitions of the newly founded society. Sir, the attention of your readers is drawn to the existence of the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society, the only one of its kind which follows the work of Israeli archaeologists and presents it to those interested here. This society, affiliated to the Friends of the Hebrew University, was founded last November under the presidency of the Right Honorable Lord Cohen, Privy Councillor, with a memorable lecture by Dr. Yardin on his findings in the caves by the Dead Sea. Since then, other lectures of great interest have been given by specialists from Israel, and the society has attracted many members. The support of many more is much needed and will be greatly welcomed. Times have not changed. In return, they will receive regular publications dealing with archaeology in the Holy Land. The first annual meeting of the Society is being held at 5.30 next Tuesday in the rooms of the Society of Antiquaries in Piccadilly. Um, and he uh, goes on to say that the funds of the Society are used to support archaeological work in Israel. It was Richard Barnett, above all, who would go on until his death to build IAS into a learned society distinguished by public lectures delivered by leading experts, academic publications including from 1981 an annual bulletin edited by Roberta Harris and Jeremy Schoenfield, the precursor of our journal Strata, and to raise funds for archaeologists and students working on archaeological projects in Israel. Richard Barnett's long-standing leadership and support for other organizations, including the Jewish Historical Society of England, the Palestine Exploration Fund, and the Hebrew University, created enduring alliances from which we benefit today. We salute his dedication, his leadership, his scholarship, and his passion for sharing the extraordinary discoveries of Israel's archaeology with the wider world. And so you'll be relieved to know I am soon to stop speaking and pass over to our distinguished speaker, Martin Goodman. We are exceptionally fortunate to have Martin Goodman as our lecturer on this most important occasion in the life of the society. Martin Goodman has a long and distinguished career within the University of Oxford. Appointed to teach Jewish history in 1986, he recently became Emeritus Professor of Jewish Studies at Oxford and Emeritus Fellow of Wilson College and he is also a former president of the Oxford Centre for Hebrew and Jewish Studies. Early recognition of his outstanding contributions to research came in 1996, only 10 years after the appointment, with his election as a fellow of the British Academy. He is a long-standing member of the executive committee of the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society, a former chair until 2014, and currently a vice president of our society. In the academic world, we often hear claims about people and work that are world-leading. But in Martin Goodman, we have a scholar who is absolutely the genuine article, someone who has transformed the study of Jews and Judaism, particularly, but not exclusively, in the Greco-Roman world. He has also transformed the professional lives of many gen generations of students of ancient history and Jewish studies, some of whom are here tonight and some of whom also serve on the committee of this society. His many works include studies of Roman Galilee, of the First Jewish War, and the history of the struggle between Jerusalem's ruling class and Rome's leadership that led to war in 66. His book, Rome and Jerusalem, published in 2008, was received to great critical acclaim, acknowledged as a landmark in the study of the history of the Jewish people under Roman rule. Looking beyond the ancient world, Martin led a major Leverhulme project fostering the work of a team of early career researchers on evidence for diversity and tolerance within Judaism in widely different contexts. And with Tessa Rajak, he led an AHRC project on the Jewish reception of Josephus from late antiquity to the modern world. His edited volume, The Oxford Handbook of Jewish Studies, published in 2002, was awarded the National Jewish Book Award for scholarship. And in 2017, he published A History of Judaism, A Global History of Jewish Religion from the Second Millennium to the Present. His is an extraordinary record of world-leading distinction for research and teaching, 
a scholar who has so successfully brought his subject, so often in the past, relegated to the sidelines or out of sight completely to the forefront of the study of the ancient world and public understanding of the history of Judaism. Martin Goodman is currently writing a biography of Herod the Great for Yale University Press. And we are greatly privileged to have Martin speak to us this evening on the subject of Herod the Great, King of Judea and King of the Jews. It is a wonderful subject. To quote Seth Schwartz, Herod is the best attested of all ancient Jews, of all Roman client kings, probably one of the best attested of all Romans. Josephus devoted more than four books of his histories to Herod's life and career. Herod's building projects are the stuff of archaeologists' dreams. It's my honor now to ask Martin to deliver the Richard Barnett Memorial Lecture. Well, it's a great honor. Uh, to be asked to give this lecture in memory of Richard Barnett at such a special occasion. Uh, Richard was a great scholar with insatiable curiosity and huge energy and prolific output. Not least of his many achievements was the foundation of this society over which he presided as chairman for so many years. He died nearly 36 years ago but for me, his memory remains very fresh, from visits to Elden Grove, where he and Barbara were so hospitable, not just to many visiting scholars, but also to teenage cousins visiting London from the depths of the Essex countryside. Uh, it is a shame that Barbara is not here in person, uh, but I send greetings through the film and it's a delight that Celia, Robbie, and Colin are here uh, in person. Herod is a king. You can see him sitting there on his throne. And my topic today comes out of the uh, project which Sarah referred to, to write a biography of Herod uh, as a Jewish life. And already in antiquity, Herod was accused of being only half Jewish, albeit by a political opponent at a time of stress and as a pun on his origins in Idumea, Idumaios Judesi Hemi Judaios in Greek. His father, though, was indeed Idumean, and the Idumeans from the area around Hebron had a uh, uh, had converted to Judaism only two generations earlier, and his mother was a Nabataean Arab. So the question, how Jewish was Herod? How Jewish was he as a king? Either in his own eyes, or in the eyes of non-Jews, such as Romans, or in the eyes of other Jews, crops up again and again. Later portraits of Herod do not show him as Jewish. It is striking that there are no contemporary portraits that survive, despite the huge number of portraits of contemporary Romans from the time when Herod was, li was living, and indeed uh, of other client kings. And this lack of contemporary pictures is probably significant in light of Herod's attitude to depictions of humans in public places in his Jewish territories, about which I shall have more to say shortly. Later Jewish images of Herod show him as a grand king, like Pharaoh. That's what you have here. The image comes from a, uh, a uh, publication in 1546 of a Yiddish translation of the Hebrew Yosipon, uh, which had been produced in the 10th century as a 
Jewish version uh, of part of Josephus's history from the first century, which had been written in Greek. So this 1546 edition, published in Zurich, shows the Hasmonean high priest Hyrcanus II before Herod the king as he pleads with him um, to be allowed to return uh, to uh, Judea uh, from exile in Babylon. This image itself was taken by the publishers in 1546 uh, from the Froschauer Bible, also published in Zurich, uh, originally in 1531. And the woodcut uh, is by Hans Holbein the Younger. It shows Joseph before Pharaoh. So Herod is Pharaoh. Uh, and that's the best picture that the publisher of this uh, Yiddish Yosipon could find to represent what he thought Herod looked like. He is a big king and he's not nice. Uh, later Christian images show him just as a tyrant. This is uh, the Rubens Masker of the Innocents from 1612. Uh, and this image of Herod uh, as a slaughterer of babies comes from the infancy nar narrative for uh, the infancy of Jesus, found in the Gospel of Matthew, um, from which the standard picture of Herod within the Christian world was derived. And this uh, notion that uh, Herod was a tyrannical king uh, who uh, killed small children uh, runs over into the passion plays of the medieval world in the uh, uh, in Western Europe, and is what lies behind the depiction in Hamlet of uh, an over-enthusiastic uh, actor out-heroding Herod in his depiction of wickedness. It's worth noticing that Matthew inserted the Exodus motif uh, into uh, the birth narrative of Jesus, and that's why the Holy Family goes off to uh, Egypt. Um, and so this depiction of Herod as a pharaoh um, is fitting into a, a wider picture too. But um, as uh, Sarah's just told us, uh, the real Herod is actually one of the best known people from the Roman world and by far the best known Jew from antiquity. By far. We know far more about him uh, than any other Jew in the Roman world, or indeed, I think, at any time uh, down to the Middle Ages. Uh, our evidence for what he was like uh, comes from Josephus, uh, the author who wrote at the end of the first century CE, primarily in his Antiquities of the Jews in 20 books, of which two and a half books were devoted to Herod. So a huge amount, uh, and uh, partly from his account of the Jewish war against the Romans, in which most of the first book of seven was devoted to Herod. The reason for this uh, lack of proportion uh, in giving so much attention to Herod uh, was simply that Josephus knew a lot about him because of the writings of Herod's court historian, Nicolaus of Damascus, a great uh, orator and intellectual uh, came from Damascus, clearly from the name, not Jewish, uh, who had lived at the court of Herod and who ended up writing, writing about Herod uh, in the city of Rome after Herod's death in 4 BCE. So the basics of his life, in 73 BCE, he was born the son of an Idumean Antipater and of a, uh, a Nabataean uh, Arab princess. Uh, in 47 BCE, Antipater granted Roman citizenship. Uh, in 40 BCE, Herod himself uh, was proclaimed as king of Judea in Rome by the Roman Senate and celebrated with a sacrifice uh, to Jupiter Capitolinus on the Capitol. Uh, three years later, 37 BCE, he captured Jerusalem with the help of Roman forces 
and managed to keep ruling in Jerusalem down to his death in 4 BC. So that's the basic narrative. And you can see uh, that in many respects, Herod is part of the Roman world, almost certainly a Roman citizen like his father and like his grandson was known to be, and a product of a period of particular turbulence uh, in the Roman world. He lived through and came to power during the Roman Revolution in 49 BC. That's when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon uh, and started the civil war against Pompey. 44 BC, Julius Caesar was assassinated on the Ides of March. Octavian, the future emperor Augustus, marched on Rome as Caesar's heir and son of God. And for the next 10 years, 42 to 32 BC, the struggle for supremacy between Octavian and Mark Antony, which ended up in the victory of uh, Octavian at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. And by 27 BC, Octavian had uh, transformed himself uh, as the Emperor Augustus in sole control of the Roman world. And in many respects, the career of Herod uh, is based upon his relationship with this new emperor, Augustus. Uh, Octavian, future Augustus, had supported the appointment of Herod as king of Judea in the Senate uh, in 40 BCE. He and Mark Antony had stood either side of Herod as he came down from the Senate House after he'd been proclaimed as king. In 31 BC, Herod had been on the wrong side, supporting Antony, and missed the Battle of Actium, fortunately for him. Um, and uh, uh, in 30 BC, Octavian accepted Herod's promise to transfer support to him, as indeed Octavian accepted the promise of transfer of support from most of the client kings in the Eastern Roman Empire. In 27 BC, Herod founded the city of Sebasti. Sebastos is the Greek version of Augustus, uh, with a temple dedicated to Augustus. And in 22 BC, founded the city of Caesarea, with a temple to Roman Augustus, built another temple to Augustus in Panion in the north of Galilee, and began the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. So this is the Roman uh, life of Herod ending up with the building of the temple in Jerusalem. So Herod's career was shaped by Augustus's new methods to ensure one man rule over, after this period of uh, intense civil war. Between 49 and 31 BC, more troops were levied in the Mediterranean world to fight on behalf of individual Roman aristocrats seeking power for themselves and at any time until the Napoleonic Wars. So it was horrific. Uh, and it was all to do with striving for power. Once Augustus is in power, he looks to a client king like Herod as an individual Roman who would be supportive of his power. The territory granted to Herod in 40 BC, with later uh, additions by Augustus, included many non-Jews as well as many Jews. That's the map of his kingdom. Um, so you've got up in the north the Ituraeans, who are uh, Arabs, and then the Samaritans, whose relationship with uh, Judeans was uh, always um, somewhat um, uh, difficult. And most importantly, the Greek cities of the coast and of the Decapolis, uh, so places uh, like Gaza and Joppa and Ptolemaeus, uh, current Akko, um, and then over uh, to the east of the Jordan, places like Gadara um, and uh, Gerasa, Jerash. Uh, the transformation of his kingdom by Herod was essentially Romanization. So as we can see on the map, new cities were named after Augustus, Sebasti in 27 BC, Caesarea in 22. And the early integration of worship of Roman Augustus already in the 20s BC, so very early in the uh, imposition of the imperial cult. Um, so here we have from Sebasti, uh, the temple of Roman Augustus. 
and in Caesarea, where the great new harbor was built by Herod using new techniques imported from Italy uh, in order to ensure that the concrete would set uh, in the water around the harbor. And at the top of the hill, around the, uh, uh, directly opposite the uh, curve of the harbor, uh, the great uh, temple of uh, Roma and Augustus reconstructed here, which could be seen from way out to sea for those who uh, were sailing into Herod's territory. The first thing they saw up on the hill above Caesarea as they came into the new harbor was the temple of Roman Augustus. So that's his Roman side. What about his Jewish side? Well, the clearest evidence that Herod wished to be seen by his Jewish subjects as a Jewish king is his rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple. There it is. <laughs> right, a bit of it. Um, uh, but, but even just the bit of it that we now see uh, with the excavations down on the southern, uh, uh, on the, uh, around the southern uh, platform um, is enough to show us quite a, what an extraordinary achievement uh, this uh, rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem was. The great platform uh, that was built by Herod is still there under the Mosque of Omar. Um, and uh, in many ways, the, the reconstruction of the, uh, the, the, the center part of Jerusalem was the product of Herod's building. Now, according to later Jewish traditions, Herod was bad but his temple was good. So, Babli Sukkah, uh, he has not seen the temple in its full construction, has never seen a glorious building in his life. Which temple? I suppose it could have been Solomon's. Uh, Abaya, or maybe Sista said, the references to the building of Herod. So, people remembered Herod had done it, even though they didn't think much of Herod himself, himself or indeed, in the rabbinic tradition, say much about Herod himself. So he's pretty well absent um, from most of the uh, rabbinic stories until we come down to the Yosipon version of uh, Josephus uh, in the 10th century. Uh, what Herod intended to do, according to Josephus, who got his information from Nicolaus, was evidently to build himself a memorial. So in the 18th year of his reign, Herod undertook an extraordinary work, the reconstructing of the temple of God at his own expense. The big question is where he got his money from. Uh, enlarging its precincts and raising it to a more imposing height. For he believed that the accomplishment of this task would be the most notable of all the things achieved by him, as indeed it was, and would be great enough to ensure his eternal remembrance as indeed it has, because we're talking about him now. And I don't suppose we would be if he just built the temple of Caesar and Augustus um, in uh, Caesarea. Uh, but this Jerusalem temple is also part of Romanization. Josephus put into the, mount, uh, into the mouth of Herod the speech that he made to the Jews to reassure them that he wasn't going to take down the existing temple as he rebuilt it. Uh, and as part of that speech, Herod is said to have said that by the will of God I'm now ruler, and there continues to be a long period of peace and an abundance of wealth and great revenues. And what is of most importance to the Romans, who are so to speak the masters of the world and my loyal friends, so I'm going to try to remedy the oversight caused by earlier times, that's the Hasmonean, and by this act of piety, make full return to God for the gift of this kingdom. How did he indicate that this great new temple, which you saw from the timeline, came just after he'd done the temple of, of Roman Augustus in Sebasti, Caesarea, and Paneon, up by the source of the Jordan, how did he indicate uh, that it was part of the worship of the, the, the Roman emperor also? The answer seems to have lain in the imposition of an uh, image of an eagle 
uh, above the great gate of the temple. So again, this is from Josephus, who got it from Nicolaus. Herod set about doing certain things that were contrary to the law. For the king had erected over the great gate of the temple as a votive offering and at great cost, a great golden eagle. Although the law forbids those who live in accordance with it to do such things. Just towards the very end of his life, a group of enthusiasts led by a character called Judas and Matthias pulled down uh, this eagle from the temple. And we're told in some detail by Josephus by the response of the king. Uh, he had the perpetrators bound and sent to Jericho. And they uh, came to see him where he was lying on a couch. He's very ill by this stage, uh, almost before his death. He recounted all his strenuous efforts on their behalf, on their behalf, that's on the behalf of the Jews, told them at what great expense to himself he constructed the temple, unlike the Hasmoneans. He had also, he said, adorned the temple with notable dedicatory offerings. And they had insultingly laid hands on an offering set up by him and had succeeded in pulling it down, and this was sacrilege. So it's a nice and ambiguous term. Sacrilege to whom? Sacrilege to the Jewish gods, when he's talking to Jews, but also sacrilege uh, to the Roman emperor. It is interesting that this eagle is not mentioned in any of the earlier descriptions uh, of the uh, temple, or indeed mentioned after it's pulled down at this stage in any of the later descriptions of the temple. It was presumably not put back. But it is possible that this eagle represented something uh, that was highly significant for Herod himself. Uh, this is the eagle from the half pruto or lepton, a very small bronze coinage produced um, by Herod, uh, which is oddly out of sync with all the rest of his coinage, which is an iconic. So it's got no pictures uh, of uh, animals or of humans. Um, and uh, though we don't know quite what he meant by this eagle, and there are plenty of possibilities what he might have done, it is striking that the eagle was beginning to be used by uh, uh, Augustus as part of the uh, arrangements for the point at which he would be recognized as a god uh, by the Roman Senate. Uh, and when he died in AD 14, we are told by Cassius Dio that an eagle came up from behind his pyre and flew into the, uh, up into the heavens to show that he, like his father, Julius Caesar, was a god um, and that this was a demonstration uh, of uh, his divinity. Well, as I say, th th this eagle is, is an outlier uh, because uh, in many ways uh, Herod missed an opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to indicate his, the way he wanted to be seen through coinage. So Herod's coinage is not very exciting. Um, and, and on the whole, um, it, it tends to go for very um, uh, an iconic and unexciting images. Um, and there's probably a good reason for that. The opposition to the eagle evidently took Herod by surprise since he thought he'd gone out of his way to woo his Jewish subjects, if you think of the speech we just looked at. And he had gone out of his way. After the opposition to Roman-style games with wild beast fights in Jerusalem, which he introduced after the Battle of Actium, so the, in the uh, uh, early 20s BCE, to celebrate the victory of his new patron Octavian, they were not repeated. They were quadrennial games every four years. It didn't happen again because there were objections. And the objections were because Jews said, this is not the kind of thing that we think is in accordance with our ancestral tradition. It was actually the only occasion on which there was a popular uprising against Herod throughout all his rule uh, that required uh, severe repression. Uh, so they were not repeated these quadrennial games in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, though in the new city of Caesarea, the games got going with enthusiasm. 
but this was a non-Jewish city. So he could learn Herod, and one should see the, the way in which he dealt with his Jewish subjects as a process of learning, though the eagle image uh, opposition eventually was only at the very end of his life, a bit late for him to learn this. So generally, he avoided human and animal images on his public art in Judea, as with this anchor image on the reverse of a fruit uh, um, in his coin. And there's a contrast between his private and public space in Herodian palaces and fortresses. So uh, this from uh, the, uh, the uh, throne room uh, in the Herodian uh, palace of um, Herod, where you can see uh, uh, glorious um, uh, images, uh, thoroughly enjoying himself um, with contemporary art, in striking contrast to what we have in the public rooms of Masada. And we need to pictures of Masada in celebration of the Agalia Dean and the origins of the society. So here is Masada at sunset. Uh, but there, when we get uh, mosaics, uh, we find uh, that they are non-figural mosaics, uh, such as uh, this one, and there are many uh, other examples. As part of his appeal um, to uh, his Jewish subjects, uh, but often overlooked was his family policy and the policy he had for them and their marriages. Uh, that is rather extensive uh, family tree. He's uh, in the middle in capital letters, so you can see where he fits. Uh, but there's not space for all the wives at the end, so you can see at the end married five other wives on the extreme right. And much of Herod's later reputation was based on his treatment of the Hasmonean Mariami I, uh, who is the second of his wives, who he married in order to get the, uh, the prestige of the previous regime, the Hasmoneans, uh, 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 attached to him. Uh, and that's uh, the reason why so much of his reputation is based on his treatment of her is because it was her sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, um, who he put to death in 7 BC after extensive trials in the city of Rome. And that's one reason why it's so well attested, because they were very public, these trials. And then finally, the son of his first wife, uh, Antipater, who he put to death in 4 BC, all of which led to the purported comment um, from Augustus, uh, as reported in the fourth century by Macrobius in the Saturnalia, when Augustus heard that among the Jews under the age of two years, whom in Syria Herodias, the king of the Jews, had ordered to put to death was the king's own son, he exclaimed, I'd rather be Herod's pig than his son. All of which, of course, assumed that Herod was keeping food laws and not eating pigs. Um, uh, also, uh, it works better as a pun in uh, Greek. We have it in Latin, but it must have been in Greek originally, uh, since a pig in Greek is a hus and a son is a huios. So it's quite a good pun in Greek, um, pretty useless in Latin. Um, so, 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 so this is all very public, um, what happened uh, to these sons. Um, and uh, later uh, traditions focused on the, the hopeless passion of Herod uh, for the Hasmonean Mariami, which led him eventually uh, to put her to death. Uh, this is from John William Waterhouse, 1887, Mariami on her way to execution, uh, following which uh, Herod is said to have gone into a deep depression um, because uh, he did not wish to put her to death. Though the possibility that she was indeed um, conniving against him was extremely strong, uh, given that she had every right to expect power in her own right, as her grandmother, Alexandra Dinea Blomstion, had done. Uh, but more interesting, I think, for the way that uh, Herod portrayed himself to his uh, Jewish subjects was what he did with the other wives, not Mariami, 
to whom he was so devoted. When she died, he started marrying with enthusiasm. In 7 BC, there were nine wives married to King Herod. And we're told why by Josephus. He had many wives, as Jewish custom traditionally allowed polygamy, and the king was happy to follow it. That's all we're told, but it's curious, because other Jews don't seem to have followed it, including other members of Herod's family didn't follow it. They didn't have lots of wives uh, at the same time. Um, what it did do was to demonstrate to his Jewish subjects that he wasn't just being an ordinary Roman. There's something very striking about this multiple marriages. It turns out to be extremely useful because by the time he killed off three of his sons as heirs, he had a series of remaining sons from his remaining wives. And from two of those wives, he ended up, in the end, with three heirs who were indeed appointed by the Roman state to take over his share, his kingdom, after him uh, in 4 BCE. Um, so the, these, these are real wives, meaning that the, the, the offspring is not just uh, concubines, because their offspring are recognized uh, by Herod as potential heirs to power. Um, and, and indeed, so, so they turned out to be. And then finally, Herod as king of the Jews. But we're actually explicitly told by Josephus that Herod was uh, appointed by Antony and Octavian in 40 BC as king of the Judea, Jews, Judaioi, um, in Greek. Uh, this is partly an accident of terminology. Uh, Judaioi in Greek means both Jews and Judeans. So it could be the people who live in Judea and Jews who live elsewhere. So in my view, it's almost always in this period uh, used of Jews. We never get the term used of non-Jews who happen to be live, living in Judea as ruled over by uh, Herod. Well, these Jews by Herod's time were spread over much of the Roman world and east into Babylonia and the Parthian Empire. Uh, the great philosopher Philo listed the Jewish settlements in the eastern Mediterranean, starting in Egypt and going north up the Mediterranean coast uh, into the coast of Turkey and, uh, and of Macedonia and Greece. Um, and there are many Jews also uh, from the time of Pompey, 53 BC, uh, in the city of Rome. Now, in some sense, Herod could portray himself as patron for all Jews, as users of the temple. Because his rebuilding of the temple encouraged international pilgrimage to an extent that it had never occurred before. And the Acts of the Apostles tells us uh, 30 years or so after Herod's death about the great crowds of people from every country under heaven uh, who were there in Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost. The great harbor at Caesarea enabled uh, boats to come in from all around the Mediterranean world, and the Pax Romana meant there were no longer any pirates uh, who had been suppressed by Pompey uh, in the 70s BCE. So it's perfectly possible for pilgrims to come. I was told actually quite explicitly that in 7 BCE, Herod built a, uh, sorry, had it allowed to settle uh, in an area northeast of the Sea of Galilee, a, a squadron of Babylonian Jews as a military colony in order to protect those pilgrims who were coming from Babylonia to Jerusalem to come to bring their offerings at times of the pilgrimage festival. Uh, they weren't protecting an awful lot of the pilgrimage route, of course, um, but it was particularly wild up there in Batania and up on the Horan. So he could portray himself as patron of Jews when they came to Judea, but he could also be the patron of Jews in their diaspora homes. In 14 BC, the Jews of Ionia came before Agrippa, the great friend of the Emperor Augustus, and demanded their rights, the rights not to sit in court on Saturdays, 
their rights to send their temple monies to Jerusalem and not to the local temple, their rights not to serve military service. Um, and they appealed uh, to Herod, who in turn intervened on their behalf. We know so much about this intervention because a really good speech that was made on Herod's behalf was done by Nicolaus of Damascus. And because he made it, and he wrote us the history from which this all comes down, uh, he is very keen that later people should know what a good speech it was. Uh, it didn't necessarily mean that the Asper Jews thought highly of Herod. When Herod died in 4 BCE, the Jews of Rome were very hostile. 8,000 of them said they did not want to have any of his sons uh, to end up as uh, ruler of Judea because he had been a wicked and uh, an um, uh, overbearing king. And Herod is interestingly never said to have intervened on behalf of the huge community of Jews in Alexandria in Egypt, uh, unlike his grandson Agrippa I, who had a great deal to do there. And despite the pressures on the Jews of Alexandria in Egypt, about which we know not least from papyri from Egypt, so we know their difficulty in, up, in upholding their legal status uh, within the city. In the end, Herod's final, final resting place had already been identified by Herod uh, in the early 20s BCE, and it's the remarkable site of Herodium. Superbly excavated by the great and much missed uh, Ehud Nebzer. The location, in my view, is more likely to commemorate Herod's victory on the site, as he was gaining power, which is what we're told by Josephus, and the visibility of the monument from a distance, rather than anything messianic, uh, despite the closeness of Herodium to Bethlehem, uh, despite interesting recent suggestions by our colleague uh, Jody Magnus. But I think it is significant that Herod evidently thought that great Jewish kings should have grand monuments. Because we're told that the tomb of David in 10 BCE in Jerusalem was reconstructed by Herod. We don't know where, and we don't know uh, why he chose to do it precisely then. In hugely expensive white marble, it would have been one of the very few buildings in Jerusalem that actually used marble. And we're told explicitly that it was marble. Um, and he did so uh, because uh, he wanted to do so as an act of piety. So Herod too, despite the unusual shape of his tomb in Herodium, which in many respects is much closer to Augustus's mausoleum in Rome, that was being built at the same kind of period, circular <laughs> shape, Nonetheless, he too wanted to be remembered, like King David, as a great Jewish king. Good evening. My name is Anthony Rabin. I'm Anglo-Israel's Honorary Treasurer. Before saying a few words about our Diamond Jubilee appeal, it's my great pleasure to thank Martin on behalf of us all for such a fascinating lecture. Martin has so masterfully shown us that, perhaps not surprisingly, Herod was a very complex individual whose key to survival was, Janus-like, looking two ways at once. Indeed, who knows? to coin a phrase, whether Herod always favoured his pigs over his sons. Because we don't have our usual question and answer session this evening, with Martin's permission, I invite you to email our administrator, Sheila Ford, with any questions you might have um, otherwise have asked Martin. Martin will respond via Sheila, and the dialogue will appear on the website as an addendum to the video of Martin's lecture. Martin. Again, many thanks for a wonderful lecture.
I'm now going to say a few words about the launch of our Diamond Jubilee Appeal, but I am acutely conscious that I stand between you and food and drink. Always a very precarious position, and therefore I shall be very brief. I'm going to start by describing our aims for this appeal before playing a very short video of Professor Shimon Gibson, one of our trustees, talking about the Mount Zion project, of which he is director, and which has been closely connected with Anglo-Israel now for several years. And at the end of that, I'm going to ask another of our trustees, Dr. Rebecca Welton, who's also been involved when she was a student with the project, to come to the platform and say a few words before leaving you in the hands of Tessa, who will, you'll be relieved to know, point you in the direction of refreshments. <laughs> the trustees have decided to use the occasion of this gathering to launch a special appeal to mark our Diamond Jubilee. It will be targeted at a specific archaeological project in Israel whose identity will be decided upon during the course of the appeal, which will run for 12 months. The reason that we decided not to identify the project initially is to allow, over the course of the year, projects that are at inception at the moment to firm up on arrangements, particularly funding, so as to present the strongest possible candidature. The funding will be used in three ways. Firstly, to provide a substantial grant or grants to one or more students or early career candidates to be associated with the project and gain on the ground archeological experience. As many of you will know, we have historically provided four or five travel grants each year to students to go on a variety of digs in Israel. But this will be different. Firstly, the bursary or bursaries will cover not only travel, but also all living expenses in Israel. Additionally, it will be focused on one project rather than four or five. Secondly, we'll be funding a teaching component to the digs so as to assist the project director and staff with structured learning for all the volunteers on the dig. And lastly, we'll be looking for ways to assist the project budget in funding travel from time to time for a range of specialists who may benefit the project with their expert knowledge. Our chair and committee are busy structuring a campaign to run during the appeal, and we've developed a separate page on our website which will update you as to progress along with giving you stills and videos of the projects we've helped in the past. We've also, you'll be pleased to know, have developed a web link for donations, which we've not had up until now. So that's enough from me. Let's now hear from Shimon Gibson, Professor of Practice in the History Department at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, but has recorded this special video for the occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is truly a momentous occasion to be with you this evening at the British Academy, albeit uh, via uh, Zoom all the way from North Carolina in the States. It is wonderful to be able to celebrate with you uh, the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society's Diamond Jubilee. I have been a committee member of this amazing society since the early 1980s, when it was chaired by Richard Barnett. I'm very grateful to the current chair and committee of the society for inviting me tonight to address you very briefly on the subject of the archaeological excavations we are conducting at Mount Zion in Jerusalem, for which the society has lent us their constant support over the years in getting students and staff out to Jerusalem. We also had the late Dr. Nick Slow working with us as a staff member on the Mount Zion dig as many of you know, he was the Society's Honorary Secretary for many years. He will be missed by us all. I'm now going to show you a selection of slides showing finds from a number of the archaeological periods that have been uncovered in the Mount Zion dig. So you should be able to see the uh, 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 front uh, picture of uh, this uh, presentation, and you can see a picture of the old city uh, looking towards northeast. And in this second picture, you'll be able to see our excavations uh, in that triangular area 
with uh, Old City and the Jewish Quarter uh, in the background, looking towards the, the north. And in this third picture, uh, uh, Nick Slope, um, who uh, worked with us, he's seen here investigating one of the lower water systems and the cover of uh, his uh, memoirs. Last season, uh, we got down to an ashy layer uh, uh, dating from Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BCE. You'll remember that the Babylonians managed to destroy the city and the Jewish temple, and many of its inhabitants were carried away into captivity. To find this lair was very exciting. Burnt ashes and uh, iron and bronze arrowheads from the battle. Also an amazingly well-preserved silver and gold earring, which was left behind by one of the Israelites fleeing for her life. In the next season, in the summer of 2023, we plan to excavate much more of this lair from the Babylonian destruction. Um, the Roman remains at the site, dating back 2,000 years to before the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus and the Roman legions in 70 CE, are extremely well preserved, with the rooms with their ceilings still intact. We have a wonderful gold coin of uh, Nero and a stone cup inscribed with a mysterious inscription. Work on decipherment is currently underway. There's much more Roman material to uncover at the site and we intend to do so in the next season. Another discovery was an expanse of paving belonging to an ancient street dating from the Byzantine period and clearly it served as an extension of the major column street Cardo Maximus seen in the Madaba mosaic map of the city. The exact date of the, this street is still uncertain. It might have been established at the time of the construction of the main church of Hagia Sion on the summit of the hill at the end of the fourth century. Alternatively, it may have been built by Justinian in the mid sixth century uh, you can see him here on the left. At the time, the Cardo Maximus Street was being extended to the Nair Church. We cannot be certain, but by lifting up the paving stones to see what the latest coins are found sealed beneath them, we might be able to furnish an exact construction date. This is what we intend to do next season. There's much more uh, that I could uh, tell you about the Mount Zion excavations. But I would like to move on to tell you about a new five-year project we intend to undertake from 2024. It will be at the site of a Jewish village from the Roman period in the Lower Eastern Galilee. The site is known as Horvat Amudim, and it has a basilica, synagogue, and other very well-preserved buildings and houses. We intend this project to be educational to train US and UK students in archaeological methods. The overall purpose of this project, however, is to examine the changing material culture of Jewish Galilean society from the first to fourth centuries CE. You can see this amazing carving of lions uh, with the remains of an ancient building behind uh, uh, that has not been excavated. This is, as you know from the program, official launch of the Society's Jubilee Appeal. The generosity of all those present is greatly appreciated, and it is for good cause to further our knowledge of the ancient past of the land of Israel. Think about contributing. Even a small donation will be highly appreciated, and it will give you a stake in uncovering the past. As you know, the society has been very successful in getting feet on the ground, so to speak. That is, getting British students to go out to Israel, to participate in archaeological work, and for graduate students to help with their research and field work. One success story has been Dr. Rebecca Welton, who started out as a volunteer on the Mount Zion excavations with grants from the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society eventually becoming an era supervisor, and today she is a core staff member of the Mount Zion expedition. 
uh, Rebecca teaches at the University of Exeter and does service as a committee member of this society. So thank you very much to all of you and enjoy the continuation of your evening. Take care. I hope you enjoyed seeing what an amazing project Mount Zion is and what an interesting new project Shimon has, which I have no doubt will be a strong candidate for the Appeal Award. But without further ado, let's now hear from Rebecca Welkin about her experiences at Mount Zion. Rebecca, can you come to the stage? Everybody. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you very much, Shimon. I first worked with Shimon on the Mount Zion excavations when I was a master's student in 2013. I was actually put in contact with Shimon and the dig by Professor Joan Taylor, who taught me at King's College London in the Bible and archaeology. And as you can see in the second photo, I spent a good portion of my first excavation digging out a first century water system and found complete vessels in the mud near the bottom. This moment cemented my interest and passion for the archeology span of Jerusalem and ancient Israel. I was invited back in subsequent seasons as a junior staff member and gradually, year on year, my responsibilities increased. I was successful in receiving funding from the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society to support me in flying out to Jerusalem. Without this, I would have not been able to have the opportunities to progress and develop in the field or to experience Jerusalem and visit other archaeological sites in Israel. Each season, I was able to gain more experiences and skills in relation to the successful excavation of a complex archaeological site. In 2016, I was very lucky to have met Nick Slope, who was also on the staff of the Mount Zion Dig. He was extremely supportive of my development as a student of archaeology, and I am so grateful for his input during this time. In 2017, I was made an area supervisor for the first year. And as any area supervisor knows, the more responsibility one is given, the less physical digging one actually does. Nevertheless, the experiences I gained from Mount Zion, the mentoring I received from Shimon Gibson, and the financial support of the AIAS that facilitated this have been so influential in my life, I can hardly begin to express the impact fully. Through my doctoral studies, in which I researched food and drink in Iron Age Israel and the Hebrew Bible, the Mount Zion dig allowed me to incorporate insights from material culture with a critical eye that could only be gained from having had these experiences in the field at Mount Zion. I am now a lecturer at the University of Exeter, and I'm able to pass on my love and passion for archeology span and biblical studies to my own students. So I would just like to take this opportunity to thank the Anglo-Israel Archaeological Society for all the work it has done and continues to do to support students like I was in gaining archaeological experience in Israel. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you very much indeed. A very powerful um, story, I think. So Shimon and Rebecca have done all the hard work. It merely remains for me to say, please support this appeal generously. Our website is worth a visit, and you'll find ways to support the project there. Alternatively, 
do contact our administrator, Sheila Ford, whose email you all have, if you'd like to contribute. This is not the last that you'll be hearing from me on this exciting venture. And now, over to Tessa. <laughs>